The advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Pichet and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grand is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Dr. Grand Dr. Doreen Grand Dr. Doreen Grand is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning, and I'm throwing my phone already. Uh, good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Penrod, and look who I'm here with, the wonderful, the fabulous Dr. Doreen Graham Pichet. Good morning. We're so excited to have you here, Thank and you, you. just uh, you lo look lovely, as always, <laughs> and uh, thrilled. For those of you who are not familiar with Dr. Graham Pichet, Dr. Doreen, as we call her, she is a true expert in this field of autism, and she's been working in this field for more than 45 years. I know if you're watching the live video, you're looking and going, I don't believe it. I know, I'm sitting close to her and I don't believe it, but it's true. Um, and for those of you, whether you're watching the video or you're going to listen later on in podcasts, once you listen to her, you'll believe it because she is a voice of reason and discernment in this community. You, I don't think there's anybody who has been a better advocate for individuals on Thank the you. spectrum and their families to be treated as individuals and to be treated fairly and to be Thank treated you, with respect so that they can learn things that are important to them but not have their time wasted and not be treated unfairly. So yeah. thank you very much. God I bless you. Uh, to <laughs> it's be hard for me to believe that it's been like 45 years. It's insane. Right? Yeah. I mean, like yeah. that's a long time. Yeah. And you've helped so many people and so many people are grateful. <laughs> but that's not enough for you. You're, you know, you're foraying back in, and, am, yes. which and we I'm, respect. And I'm learning again. You know, it's interesting. I just picked up a magazine the other day that, I had just is called autism, like on the mm -hmm. I'd never seen it before, and it's oh. like some uh, just summary of all the different things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And there's things in there that I hadn't even thought about, so it's kind of interesting always to come back to autism. It is an interesting time, but you you've never really left. We should say that right, you've stayed right. and answered questions, but you're going into back, to, you know, to. Helping to coordinate direct Were you treatment say into battle. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 you know, ba I was going to say into treating, and I think that you will yeah. be treating. You've always been treating, but but I think back into managing a large amount of treatment yeah. um, and yeah. overseeing a lot of of what's happening. It's your gift to all of us. Uh, you're Thank certainly you. a gift to me and to my family, Thank you. and um, and I know to our viewers because throughout everything, even in your quote unquote retirement, which I laugh because I don't, I yeah. wasn't wasn't very much of a retirement but um, you have been here doing live shows we've been this we're in our 13th year now of doing yeah. these live shows where you answer people's questions from around the world everybody can write in for free and and pick her beautiful gorgeous brain and ask her questions now there is an asterisk here we have to give the disclaimer that there is no one in this or any field that can give individual specific advice in this particular format right. it would be a disservice both to the professional and the individual that were being discussed, they don't have an opportunity to meet and see things. Right. But you know, you do have the opportunity to write in if you're as specific as possible and tell Dr. Grant Pichet what it is that your question is about. And again, be specific. I also like for you to include what's the closest major city because that sort of keys both of us into knowing what resources might be available for you. Then she can give you some things to go back to the individuals, the experts who have eyes on the situation. She can give you great questions to ask and, and ask you to think about things maybe the way that you previously hadn't thought about that will open new things. I love listening to your questions, things that I would never ask because I go, oh, well, that would never occur to me. And, and I learn still yeah, after 13 years. Yeah, I feel the same years. way, honestly, with you. You always like put a different perspective on it, and I feel the same way. It's, oh, that's very sweet. I think sweet. it's always nice just to like bring up topics and talk about them, because we do have different perspectives, and I think it helps people also just kind of think of different things they may have not thought about. We always talk about the fact that you know you are such an expert. I, I don't give my disclaimer that I'm not an expert. I'm a pony, a parent <laughs> of a neurodiverse individual, an individual that was in fact treated by you and your team, and I'm right. forever grateful. Um, and so proud of him and so proud of the work that you guys did with him. I can't talk about it much because I well up and, and, it, and it's oh, a thing. it's an amazing story, I mean, yeah. Even though it, yeah. It is an amazing story, and I'm so thrilled and excited and proud that it's our story but that's why uh, part and parcel why of how, how much expect ex 
respect and, uh, you know, joy I have being able to Thank sit you. here and help you to share with other people. Um, Thank you, but Shana. I continue to learn from you, so we have to say that. Uh, we want to say good morning to Autism Journey with Elijah. We're thrilled that you're here already, which brings me to the fact that any of you can be writing in right now. Our chat is open if you're watching us live. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and about a dozen other sites. Traven will flash those up on the screen for those of you who are watching either live or watching later on because we put the video of this it all of the there's a library of videos on YouTube you can watch with video we know though that many of you prefer to take us with you on your hike or in your car and listen in podcast audio only version that version of the show is available wherever you get your podcast but here is a very important note in the past, everything just existed on Autism Live. But that was really a disservice to Ask Dr. Doreen, which is very much its own show and really always has been. So we are now branching off as part of the Autism Network, and we're starting to birth other shows. But Ask Dr. Doreen is now its pod standalone podcast, and you should subscribe to it as its standalone podcast because right now we will upload this show to both Autism Live and Ask Dr. Doreen, but very soon we're going to be phasing that out on Autism Live. We just wanted to give those of you who right. listen the opportunity to, because I don't want it to be missing from your feed. So please take the, a moment, go over, subscribe to it in Ask Dr. Doreen. You will notice for our podcast that they we have ads. Yes. And because that's a reality. I think that's all yeah, podcasts. Sure. And, and we appreciate the sponsors who help us to keep the lights on. And we hope that you will appreciate them too. Some of you have written in and said, but hey, I would rather pay you directly and have a, an ad-free version. Oh. And that is now available for all of the podcasts that we do. Right now, that's only in one place. So uh, you can go to glow.fm. That's F as in Frank, M as in Mary. Uh, so glow, G-L-O-W dot F-M slash Autism Live. And there is a small monthly fee. I believe it's $5 that you can pay. But if you'd like to do it for the year, they literally charge us every time they run your credit card. So we get a savings if you do it by the year, and we pass that savings on to you. So you can get a better rate if you do it for the entire year. And you can do that. And then all of the episodes will show up in an in a inbox that's specifically for you, and you won't have any of the ads. If you choose that. But for many of you, we know that you appreciate getting it for free and we That's appreciate great. you we, listening to the ads. It's awesome. Are we planning to do that for other channels that we're on as well? Because it's great. I do that with a lot of my podcasts. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to be all the places that you guys need all of the time in whatever way you want. Some of you need to get it free. Some of you need to be able to get it at a, at a cost so that you get it without your ads. Right, so right. there it is. Hey, you know what else we have to bring up is that very soon we are having the second annual All Ghouls Gala. And we have a short uh, but hopefully funny video for you to watch. Traven, can we take a look at the All Ghouls Gala ad? Maybe we need to wait for it. Okay, we're ready to roll, so let's take a look at that. It's time. The tickets are now on sale for the second annual All Ghouls Gala. Did you miss it last year? Did it eat your soul to miss so much devilish fun? Well, then get tickets this time. They're on sale right now on Eventbrite. Remember, this is adults only. No kiddies. And dress to kill, because there's a costume contest with amazingly devilish prizes. It's all happening on October 28th in Wooden Hills, California. And it's all to raise money for Autism Care Today. So, join in the good ghoulish time. Get your tickets now before they sell out. 
You have to be there to be scared. So welcome back. Couple of things. You just saw a sneak preview of a video nobody's supposed to see yet because that one says that the tickets are now available. They're not till next week. So you guys saw something that nobody else is going to see. So there you go. Um, we asked, we showed the other video yesterday and that's the one that we want to be showing this week. But um, uh, the, the thing we're asking everybody is to guess who it is in the clown mask. It's somebody that's a regular here on the show. So uh, write in if you, and if you already know, don't say. Um, so, uh, but just want to say that the tickets are not available till next week, but you can still go to the Eventbrite and you can pick, cl click on the thing that says reminder so that you'll know when they do go available next week because we do really expect them to sell out. Right. Last year was it last was, year was insane. I, like the only word that I can think of when people say what was it like, I say bacchanalia. It was. <laughs> what it was, does that mean? Like bacchanalia is when it's like wine and craziness. It's yeah. like it, it was you know. great, but I mean there was a point. I think it was like around 10 p.m. or so. Uh -huh. That I just stood there and I thought, oh my dear God, like not one other person cannot enter because yeah. this place is too full. It was hopping. It was really it was hopping. hopping. Yeah. And it's an adult Halloween party. Yeah. It's a fundraiser yeah. for Autism Care Today, but it is serious business Halloween fun for adults. There are no kids. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to yes. have a lot of different events and yes. activities. So many things to do. Yeah. And there's an, you know, an open bar that's kind of crazy. We should talk about actually the event today, later today. Yeah, <laughs> We, yeah, we have to. We have to fun. talk about it. There's things I have to update you, and the questions I have. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that the other people do too. But anyway, uh, you're screaming. You're with laughter. I love that. Um, okay, yeah, and and Rachel Bird is watching, and we love you, Rachel Bird and Kobe. We're sending, and she said, Kobe and I are thank you thankful for all your work. Oh, thank you we so much. We are both much. part of the Kobe Bird fan club. We love club. you guys. We have his painting hanging on the wall in the studio. It's a lovely, lovely thing. Um, but they were there last year. Kobe was one of the recipients of one he's, of our he's awards. He's so wonderful. I have not he's announced so it before, but can I announce right now the first of our award Oh, uh, can we? Yes. Can we? I mean, yes. Not? We've not announced it anywhere else, but Dr. Temple Grandin is our first uh, recipient of awards this year that we're announcing, and she will be there at the event. And I said to, to someone the other day, I was amazing. going to a Halloween party with Dr. Temple Grandin. It's amazing. I, I, can't, I can't imagine even anything wait. more fun. Oh right? my it's going to be ridiculous. But there are going to be so many things. There's so much fun to do. And I think you said she likes Halloween. Yeah, she, she likes she Halloween. Li yeah. she, she wanted to come last year, but she wasn't able to. But yeah. this year, she was able to come and she was really excited and it's said so yes. Great. And, and of course, she's getting one of our Lend Your Voice Awards for people who have lent their voice to the community. And yeah. she's certainly she's she's a amazing. part of the community and has lent her voice. So anyway, so that's happening. But you can go to Eventbrite, allghoulsgala.com. You can go there. It, there's a video of last year because we could talk about it endlessly. But when yes. you see the video of it, you go, oh, ho, 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 that was yeah. a party. Yeah. Um, and everybody dresses up in, con uh, in costume. There's a costume party contest have you selected your costume yet i have not i keep going back and forth because it has to be something comfortable yeah you know because i gotta be here there and everywhere right right and so, right, right. Uh, Me too. And it can't yeah. be i can't have a lot of makeup because i have to be you know oh right right you know i have something that i was thinking about doing but it's not very thematic uh -huh. now the bigger question is have you decided i'm i'm almost there Okay. I'm pretty sure what I want to do, but I'm not telling you yet. Well, no, you can't. You can't <laughs> announce it here either. But tell them who you were last year. Last year I was David Bowie in the Ziggy Stardust costume, which I loved. I walked by you 22 times before I realized <laughs> it was you. You said something. And you were like Shannon, and I went, "What? Who? What?" It was a fun I costume. I totally didn't recognize you. It was a fun you. costume. And you can see pictures of Dr. Grand Pichet if you go to that allghoulsgala.com. Uh, there's some great pictures of you standing on the red carpet yeah, with it was Joe Montaigne yeah. and um, Gary Cole. I hope we can get them to come again this yes, year. Yes, I hope so too. Yeah. We have to talk about all of that. Anyway, Dark Angel, we're saying, we're saying hello to you. And I want to. Our topic today is autism and nutrition. And I see. Um, 
Well, I, I think Autism Journey with Elijah, we're talking about popsicles, so let's jump in there. Sure. Um, last couple of weeks, Eli has been on a, had an obsession on popsicles. Last Friday, he finally got sick and threw up. I warned him, but it was just a good treat, and he wanted it. Well, this morning, he felt good, so I wanted to find out why, why there was this obsession on popsicles. He had no fever, nothing but upset tummy and vomiting, and I found out a lot. I found there is an addic uh, an additive. Ad additive of carrageenan in popsicles that causes colitis and intestinal oh ulcers. By the way, he woke up wanting more popsicles and told him no, and off to school he went. Should I be concerned? He is now eating only grilled cheese sandwiches, pizza, and popsicles. That is it. Is there something that I can do to wean him off? He also refuses to take multivitamins or any other vitamins during the day. Concerned about uh, whether about to call to the uh, pediatrician today. Am I over worried? Yeah. That's a great question, and it's almost like the life that we all kind of live with our kids, right? Yeah. So it's, it's I, I don't want to say you should be concerned because you're actually really on top of things with your child. Yeah. Um, but I do want to say that you, if I was doing an evaluation with a parent and they mentioned specifically grilled cheese sandwiches and pizza, those two alone, I would be like, whoa, gluten casein, yeah. you know? And so I think it's really important for all of us to be aware of the things that our children might be having a hard time digesting. And it really will depend on your child. So I don't, definitely don't want every parent out there to now suddenly stop t uh, having, giving their child gluten and or casein because that's very restrictive. Yeah. But I do want you to know that there have been many, many, many studies that show gluten and casein in particular cause, uh, are difficult to digest. Let's put those two out there. Are difficult to digest for kids with autism and they're broken down halfway and, and, or partially and result in inflammation in the gut. And once you have inflammation in the gut, we're talking about a whole bunch of other problems. So whether it's bloating or pain or just even uh, it affects the immune system and then it affects sleep and all these other things. And that's why it's important to know, and it's not just children on the spectrum. In general, there's you know, a vast proportion of our um, population now in the U.S. that have some form of gastrointestinal issue, um, ongoing inflammation. And I'll give you, a, you know, first of all, I want to say how incredible it is that years and years and years ago um, and I honestly I, I want to go back and do you remember the Andy network A N D I yes. and this is when it started when and I forget it's Karen I forget her last name Sorosi yes a mom yes. who God bless her because she was truly one of the very fr pioneers yeah. of this where she um, discovered that with her child there was definitely some sort of reaction, and in those days, people used to say allergy. And we're talking, this is like maybe 20 years ago already, you know? Yeah, oh, at least Or more 20 than years 20 ago. years ago, it would yeah. be. And so she started talking about this and actually wrote a book about it. She was in, I think at that time, she was living in Norway or one of those She's, countries. Well, she was 10 years ago, last time I talked to her. But she, they were actually living in Buffalo at one point. Yeah, I don't son. know. Yeah, and but she started this movement, and it was the beginning of when I started learning about kind of the leaky gut. They, that's what it, we in those days everybody would refer to it as the leaky gut, and really what it, we're talking about here is various foods that you eat and then the protein in that food. So gluten is the protein in wheat and certain other grains and casein is the protein in dairy. Um, and this is different than lactate, right? It's casein is the protein in dairy. And what happens is if you are not able to break those two proteins down all the way, when we, when we eat a protein, we first break it down to peptides, which are a chain of amino acids, and then we break it further down to amino acids, and then those amino acids are what travel through the bloodstream and provide nutrition. So if you are not able to break things down and <clears throat> they remain in the shape in, in the form of a peptide over time what is what ha was happening and is happening with a lot of individuals not just people on the spectrum is that those peptides will then 
leak through the gut lining and cause all kinds of mischief because they actually will give a message to the brain that is similar to the type of message you get from your endorphins, right? So you kind of feel loopy and high and like... Like they literally call it the opiate effect. The opiate effect, exactly. And so uh, a lot of times our kids are drawn to these particular things that they're allergic to or, or cannot digest properly because it makes them feel kind of that way, right? It's opiate effect. But the, the, not, ju not only is it keeping the child's brain from, it, like it's keeping the child's brain foggy, right? Yeah. But that aside, it's also causing additional inflammation and issues in the gut, which then become a, a really, really bad cycle um, that can affect the child's sleep, as I said, and, and food habits and so on. So whenever I hear that a child has re reduced their own diet, to a combination of casein and gluten, then I'm kind of concerned. And then I would say, you do need to check that out. And th these days, there's lots of different ways you can test for this. There's even you know, food sensitivity tests that come to your house, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you can also work with a doctor who can do an organic acids test or other types of tests to see if your child is actually breaking down these particular proteins. And then I would, you know, and then after gluten and casein, we came to realize that there are also children who are having problems with soy and corn. And so there are other things that kids cannot break down properly. And this is, by the way, also I always, you know, we live this, so we never pay attention to the fact that if you go back in time, and right now I'm watching a series with my son, which is like an 80s series, mm -hmm. and, I, and you go back in time and you... There were never, ever any commercials on TV about probiotics, like ever. Just nobody even knew what that is, right? Okay. And now you rarely find anyone who's not on a probiotic, right? And this is the healthy bacteria that we hope to help digest these various things and break down these various things. And so I just want to say that, like, definitely things have changed over the course of the last 30 years or so in terms of our food supply. And it is important to make sure that your child is getting healthy nutrition. And when I say healthy nutrition, I mean organic nutrition, food that doesn't have a million different types of pesticides on it, and that you are reducing or eliminating those particular things that your child is not able to break down. Um, and that allows the child time for their gut to heal. And that is really, really an important part of this. So, Long story short, I do think that it would be worth uh, trying to see if you can replace some of those things with items that are not gluten or casein. How do you do it, you asked? And you simply do it by, you know, fortunately nowadays there's options. There's all kinds. Mean, my daughter, my oldest daughter is gluten-free and has been for a long time, and she's also a vegetarian, so it's kind of even more difficult, but she... I mean, we go out to restaurants internationally even, and you have options, uh, as well as, of course, in the U.S. It's a lot easier. There's casein-free, there all kinds of products, cheeses, et cetera, and there's gluten-free, all kinds of products. So if you can try to see if you can change out, let's say, his grilled cheese sandwiches yeah. for something that is both casein and gluten-free and see if he's willing to take that, um, otherwise, what you do is you basically s gradually replace. So you give a you know, small amount of the item that is gluten and casein free and you reward it with something that has the, his favorites, let's say, that are not good for him necessarily. And then you gradually replace that so that you're going on a purely gluten and casein free diet. It's a little hard, but Listen, our kids will not starve. Yeah. They will, they'll maybe get a little cranky and not enjoy it, but they will go to the healthier options. It's more pressure on parents, I think, than on the child. And I love that you went down the gluten-free, casein-free path, because as soon as I saw the, the grilled cheese and the pizza, but I want to talk about the popsicles a little bit, yeah, too. Yeah, sugar and dye. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, the sugar and dye and carrageenan yeah. and the possibility that it, if, if you're obsessed with popsicles and that's all you want to eat, you can very quickly get upside down yeast-wise. Oh, absolutely, yes. Anything, actually. And, and yeast also is one of the side effects also of the gluten issue. Yeah. 
and yeast is a whole nother monster. Like once you hit and anything with sugar, like we're looking at if a child starts to get really obsessed with anything that has sugar in it, you're looking at a possibility of a yeast infection. And yeast infections are way harder to get rid of. It just takes a long time and diet and so on, and it's hard. So, and I'll be honest, we're all getting to that point now where we have to have some sort of restriction in our diets. Yep. Um, a lot of people are struggling. I mean, two thirds of the ads that come up on TV or on your feed, in your social feed has to do with diet or nutrition or weight gain or weight loss or inflammation or yeah. probiotics, prebiotics. I mean, that tells you that there's a real problem here, you know? So, yes. yeah. But, and we, we had a little conversation uh, yesterday. We were talking about, uh, was it yesterday? yesterday? We were talking, maybe it was last week. We were talking about recipes and things like that. And somehow we got talking about popsicles. Mm -hmm. Was that yesterday, you guys? I don't know. But you can make your own popsicles. And one of the things that you can do, when, when I had gestational diabetes, and so many people in my family have diabetes, so my doctor, when Jem came out, made me promise that I would never give him fruit juice. Yeah. He said, if you want to give him fruit juice, you, it has to be at least 50% cut with water. Right. And that was just the rule. He said, I don't want this child yeah. to end up with diabetes, so don't give him fruit juice. So we were already in that mindset. And so you can take those popsicles and you can get the, the molds. And yeah. we were talking yesterday about taking, we take flavored seltzers mm -hmm. and put them with the popsicles and you can put it directly with fruit. So wow. then he gets the fiber yeah. and you pack the, you pack the fruit, you know, you take three strawberries and if he likes strawberries yeah. and stick it down the yeah. popsicle thing. And then you put the, the flavored seltzer in whatever flavor he likes. So that gives it a little bit more oom yeah. and freeze those. Or if you don't want to do fruit, you could take fruit juice and, and it's that thing of if you want to wean him off of it, maybe you start with doing three quarters fruit juice with a little bit of flavored seltzer and then yeah. the next batch you make them half and gradually make it less and less so that it can be bumpy when you've got a yeast overgrowth yeah. getting off of it yeah. and you don't want to, you know, and make it And certain fruits turkey. are a little bit better than other fruits in terms That's of inflammation. True. Like berries in general are going to be your friend. Whereas things like apples and so on are not necessarily your friends. So yeah. it's you can also select, or pineapples, which have a lot of sugar. So like, you know, you basically want to pick the berries if you can and then make something out of those. I think, you know, the book that was really transformative for me, because there's been a lot of great books, but the one that's called Breaking the Cycle mm. was really a big deal for me because it talks about first you know, cleaning up the, the gluten and the casein, fixing the yeast. Yeah. And get, because it all yeah. gets, and she says that he's been on a probiotic before for black stools and that that has been better, but there's some stuff going on. Oh my gosh. And, yeah. and it's all, you know, down to the fact that when they get to the point where they're like, well, I only want to eat these three things, that's a, a very clear sign yep. things are upside down. It's hard, but I know you can do it. If anybody can do it, you can do it. Um, okay, uh, R really quickly says, if a specialist is not familiar with the term progressive ABA, should I be concerned? Can I admit that two, three months ago, I had never heard it before. This is a new term. Yeah, it's brand new. Being put out by a, a, a select group of people. Very select group, yeah. And, and, and so I don't think it's at all yeah, weird not at if all. they don't know. And it's like, it's just one of those things that a group came up with, because there is a lot of... Uh, misunderstanding about ABA and therefore a lot of people are it's just going the wrong direction which really really concerns me and I'm gonna always speak out in favor of ABA because I am worried that people misunderstand an ABA like do you remember years ago I, I don't know why I thought of this mm -mm. But remember years ago, there was the, there were these commercials about you cannot have more than four eggs a week or three oh, yeah, eggs. Yeah. And then after a while, they came back and they were like, no, you can actually have seven or eight eggs a week. And they right. were like, eggs got a bad rap. Right. ABA is getting a bad rap. Like, yeah. let's just be honest. Um, and I'm not sure why. I think there are many different reasons. Um, but regardless, ABA is just a teaching technique and um, it is a good teaching technique. It's very, very effective. 
life kind of produces ABA type situations for yeah. all of us. Uh, um, and progressive ABA, so, so people, ABA started to get a bad reputation and a group of people decided to come out and say, listen, we're doing progressive ABA, which is much more compassionate. And I, I'm not sure where that even came from in a sense because all work that you do on your own health, whether it's physical or mental, uh, is difficult, yeah. right? Whether it's you're just sitting and talking with a psychologist, it's not, you know, it's not really therapeutic unless you actually go to places that are hard to go. Yeah. And it's the same with ABA, like there's a little bit of work involved. In other words, if the child doesn't want to learn, you're doing manipulations to the program, you're increasing their rewards, depriving them sometimes of the free reward, those types of things, which I guess people could say, hey, that's mean. But the truth is, what you're doing is you're manipulating the environment so that you can teach the child skills that will help them thrive yeah. in the environment. I think it needs to be said, though, uh, you know, the, part of the reason why pe these, you know, people are saying progressive ABA is because a lot of people, myself included, are saying that ABA needs a rebrand because yeah. what happened is that, you know, if you learn about ABA and what ABA is, and that's what you talk about and you teach and you try to get other people to learn, then, then, then you have no doubt that people are being treated in a humanistic way and, and whatever. But a lot of people came into a space that had a lot of money with insurance and started hanging out a shingle and doing whatever they wanted to. They called it ABA. And now, I don't know if you remember, there was a time when, when we were doing this show, maybe you know, in the beginning, we certainly were like, we talk about ABA here. Yeah. And then there was a year where I went, we need to stop talking about ABA and put the asterisk and say, we're talking about good ABA here. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't want people to get confused with schlocky bad. So I think there are a lot of groups yeah. out there that are trying to rebrand to say, okay, we're doing, but it's, it's kind of ironic because Many people, like, you know, we had them on the show and said, define what, uh, what progressive ABA is. And people wrote in and said, I'm a BCBA. Isn't that what ABA is? Yeah. And it's yeah. hard because, but, but I certainly understand why they want to brand it progressive ABA because you need to distance yourself from those people that are doing the schlocky bad ABA, which isn't ABA. Yeah. yeah. But they've stolen, they've corrupted the name. It's yeah. horrible. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's true. And I just hadn't thought about it because like if you think about any other treatment right anything else whether it's a treatment like speech or ot or yeah. it's surgery doesn't matter anything there's going to be good and bad with with everything if somebody's performing it sure yeah right yeah, there's going to be good people. surgeons and bad surgeons yes. there's going to be good dentists and bad dentists. it just yes. is and and to be able to then go back and say like let's say you have a bad experience with a dentist but then to go and summarize and say all dentists are bad or dentistry exactly. in general is bad doesn't make any sense to me you right. know and then to say we well, are doing more compassionate dentistry dentistry is painful it's yeah. not going to be fun it never is going to be fun right, right? right, right. <laughs> so it just is and so I want viewers to realize, and this is coming from a clinician who has worked with kids of all ages, adults, et cetera, and I, as recent as a month ago, I got hit in the nose so hard mm. by a child that I thought I'm, I, my nose broke, right? Mm. And it's not like the child was intentionally trying to hit me, but sometimes children on the spectrum are not able to communicate in any other way but aggression or something that is hurtful now should i be blocking that right blocking the hit or uh, moving the child's hand so he doesn't hit me and not rewarding him when he does hit me and is that considered cruel yeah. And or is it a, is it a good thing that I'm teaching the child that hitting is not an adaptive behavior? Don't we do that with our own, with all children? Yeah. Don't we do that when a chi any child at the age of three or four in school hits another child or yeah. bites or whatever? Don't we teach them don't hit, use your words? Yeah. And that's exactly what we're doing in ABA with yeah. our kids. And so, I and then you know for. Uh, those individuals to later on in life say, I think it was traumatic for me that someone tried to teach me uh, not to hit. 
I, I just don't understand that because it's a society. And as much as we, I agree with the fact that we need to adapt and we need to be open to, and, and I love yeah. how far we've come in terms of changing society to accept individuals, not just individuals on, on the autism spectrum, but yeah. individuals of all disabilities, individuals of all beliefs. We've come to be much more accepting as a society, and I love that. At the same time, we all need to work together, right? We all Amen. need to live in the same society, and I think that's what ABA is about. It's I, about teaching people to live with the rules of society. Absolutely. Um, and I preached for, I preached for we, half we an hour. Take us to church. It's all good. Uh, okay, but I'm going to, uh, jo Joanne, we're so thrilled that you got an opportunity to watch us live, and she wanted to remind everybody that if you have a smart TV, you can watch our show on smart Ooh, TV. Ooh, I love that. And, uh, and several people love that. Uh, R wants to know, are GMOs dangerous? Here we go. Yeah. And I love that the topic today is nutrition because I myself just told Shannon that I my, I'm having so many issues that I might have to go back on an elemental diet. Mm. So yeah, I mean, GMOs are, uh, I guess, I don't know if I want to say dangerous, but yes, they are in a cycle in, in the long term. And we're talking about genetically modified foods, right? And unfortunately in the U.S., the vast majority, by far, over 90% of our food is GMO. And that is just scary because you're not getting the same nutrition from these foods. Uh, you are not able to break these foods down the same way that you would just organic foods. And they cause inflammation. So yes, in that sense, it is very harmful. And I don't know if, if any of you guys travel, but I know that like whenever I travel, it's really interesting. I've tracked this also with my kids. Whenever we travel, like Nikki, for instance, who ha is, does have, um, is gluten-free, because she does have a lot of yeah. like celiac-type <coughs> inflammation. If we're in a foreign country, like uh, we were recently in Costa Rica, she can pretty much eat anything, and it doesn't bother her. Whereas when we come back here, it's, it's partially the gluten aspect, but it's also the fact that everything is GMO in the U.S. So it's kind of, you know, that is something to be aware of and not that you can really avoid it anymore that much, but yeah. it is what it is. Y yes, uh, but when you can uh, do that. I want to get, because uh, Andrea also emailed me, and I want to read first what she said here, which goes hand in hand, sort of what she said here. My three-year-old son was recently potty trained, which I'm so proud of him and the dedication of his RBTs mm -hmm. to help him complete this task. Woohoo. Good job, everybody. He has been using the potty in all situations <laughs> and does uh, and has not had any accidents now for six weeks. The problem is he is saying, I need to go to the potty as an escape or to get access to his tablet. We used the tablet when we were training and it's still being used. My question, I guess, is when using behavior as an escape and or getting access to something, do we tackle them both together or separate or should we be fading out the tablet altogether? I'm not sure how to approach this. And as BCBA is out of town until next week, and thank you so much for all you ladies do. Thank you. That's such a wonderful situation to have. And it's I, quality I just problem. love it. It's a quality problem. I think, and by the way, I just think this is so cute. Like, I, I, I don't know. It's one of those things. How it's smart just, is this kid? I, it's so He adorable. has figured out how to hack this. Yeah, yeah. And I want my tablet, and I want yeah. you to get out of my face. So I'm going to give you the thing that you said you wanted last week. It is, I love it. That's it's brilliant. Like, it, it is. It's college like, material. It is. Totally, <laughs> totally. So I would just, um, no, I wouldn't get rid of the tablet. Whenever you have a powerful reinforcer, use it. Don't get rid of it. This is a powerful reinforcer. What I would do is I would, it sounds like you're, he still gets access to the tablet when he goes to the bathroom, which is totally fine. Make sure it's time limited because you don't want him sitting there for five minutes each time, right? Mm -hmm. So some, you need to time that. But also, what is he saying to you? He's saying, I love my tablet. I want my tablet. So why don't you produce another space somewhere else, like let's say in his room, which has a cozy corner with a bean bag and a tablet and whatever else and use that as a reinforcer so that like when he asks for and teach him to literally ask for quiet time calm time um, leisure time you name it but this is so effective for our kids when and and you don't have to give it to him every single time but you can use it 
I, for instance, you can when he's doing work, and I don't know if he's doing any kind of ABA. If he's, well, he's doing, got RBT, he has a BCBA so. and RBT, so he must be. And, and if, for instance, if he's doing natural environment work, you could put a timer on it. And for instance, every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you can say what do you want. If he's doing DTT, you can do it based on number of trials and say if you do, you know, 10 trials, you can pick your reinforcer. Let him pick, and certainly give him the opportunity. And if it gets to be too much, just thin out the schedule. Just reduce, say you now have to do 20 trials in order to get two minutes of yeah. uh, iPad. But give him a different region with the iPad, with music, with other types of reinforcers, because you always want to vary the reinforcer. Yeah. But certainly don't deprive him of it. It's a, it's a powerful reinforcer. Use it. I'm so excited because I get to work with, I think, I get to work with CJ Miyaki again. And yes. I love him. And CJ yes. was the, yes. the king of this. Like he, you know, and yes. it, the way he would do it, because there's the thing called the preference assessment, you know, before they do something. And so he'd go, you know, he, he would say to Jem, okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to do something in just a second, but what should we do when we're done? What yeah. do you want to do when you're done? Do yeah. you want to you want to play video games, or do you want to you know go to the tennis courts and and shoot your Nerf gun? What yeah. do you what do you want to do when we're done with this thing that we're about to do? Whatever it was, and maybe he would tell him, maybe he wasn't, maybe it was a surprise. But then Jem would be all hepped up. He's like, oh, I get to play Nerf guns with you. Oh, I want to do Nerf guns, and, and he'd go, okay, then we're just going to do this. And he wouldn't tell him how many trials. Like he especially came in to yeah. work on the shoe tying, yeah. and he would go, all right, so you know we're going to do this, and he'd go through the steps with him, and he'd go, yeah. can you do this? What? And he, go, and he goes, okay, now we're going to race. Yeah. We're going to see how fast can we do it. And so they would race and try to do it. And then and they would, and, and he would go, okay, can we do it again? And he would get him to do like 15 trials of doing his shoes because he knew he was getting a reinforcer, yeah. because he made it fun, because he was clear with everything. Yep. And then he'd go, okay, now we can go play with the Nerf guns yeah. on the tennis court. Yeah. And, and it was just so much fun fun. Mm -hmm. He would ask for CJ to come back. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the kind of thing that you guys want it to be. And if he had a thing that where he could go, oh, I want I want uh, downtime or whatever you want to call yeah. that, where yeah. he can go be, then he doesn't have to go in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. I love but it. But also be you're careful. Brilliant. Like what, uh, as you're saying this, it made me realize like make sh these things lose value if the child has access to them all the time. Yeah. Like for instance, in, in that case, if Jem could just run over to the uh, tennis, courts, tennis and courts and play by himself, it would lose value. It wouldn't yeah. be an important reinforcer. So make sure your child doesn't have access to those things all the time. Yeah. You got to meter it. Uh, okay. Uh, I, Lucy says, are probiotics, fish oil, and uh, broccoli extract effective for kids with ASD? My kiddo is very extremely picky with food. Are there supplements recommended for helping the redox in yeah. kids with ASD? Yeah. There's a Thank lot you so much there. for asking that. That's a fantastic question. Yeah. And I want to say, and this is good, you know, I'm saying it to you, but I, I'm listening to it myself as well. Um, you, I really, truly recommend that every parent, if you can, consult with a dietitian or a nutritionist, if you can, because there is so much there. Um, in general, I would always tell parents, yeah, fish oil is fantastic for everyone, including our kids. There's specific types of fish oil that will be more beneficial, but more for for their brain activity, not, not necessarily redox. When you have redox, you need to figure out what's causing the redox. Like, why is the child having uh, issues with digestion to begin with? It's going to be lots of different things, right? I mean, at this point, there could just be uh, your child could have an intolerance or an allergy or just inflammation due to some prior infection or not enough bacteria or bacteria in the small intestine or I mean I could go on and on and on there's so many different GI issues that could be causing redox it is important to assess first it really is like because that kind of tells you the what to do um, probiotics in general are good except for if you have SIBO for instance which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth a particular types of probiotics could make things worse. So it really is about finding out the cause first. And um, as I said, if you really, if you have a hard time connecting with a nutritionist or a dietitian, I mean, there are some f amazing people. Julie Matthews is, is a very, very 
fantastic expert. I highly recommend her. She has a wonderful website as well, uh, Nourishing Hope. Yes. And she has all kinds of information on there. We should get her back on the show again. Absolutely. She's just so smart. You can, we should really should. Like we should ask yes. her all these questions because yes. she's so fantastic at that. And she will help you with a bunch of different ideas. It, just reading her material will be helpful. She has courses that you can take online. She has a lot of good stuff going on. Um, but all that is, if it's hard for you to even connect with a nutritionist, then you can start with a home uh, sensi food sensitivity kit. Because to begin with, it, you should find out if your child is sensitive to certain things. That has a bigger response level, getting rid of things that we're not able to break down, has a much bigger effect than adding things like probiotics, etc. If you can eliminate the things that the child is reacting to or not able to digest properly, you'll get rid of inflammation gradually. And that's the key to the whole thing. There we go. I was looking up because uh, one of you asked, what was the name of the book that I was talking about? It's called Breaking the Vicious Cycle, and um, it's available on Amazon. It's called Breaking the Vicious Cycle Intestinal Health Through Diet. It's uh, by Elaine Gottschall. Oh, Elaine, um, yeah. So, oh, you know her? Yeah, yeah. So, and it's, I will tell you, you know, you, I think you got to read through what you want, but it's, it's about the specific carbohydrate diet. Yeah. I do not advocate being on that for like months on end it's hard um, but that is actually one of the primary diets for SIBO as well well there we go but I will say that you know it's I think you have to be very careful that your child doesn't go into ketosis with it yeah and we were under the care of a doctor at the time so I just want to give that little yes, asterisk it is it. hard uh, but uh, but it was so helpful Joanny says uh, Dr. Doreen I have a question about food allergies we took our 10 year old son to the allergist and they would only test him for environmental and said food allergies are only anaphylactic. This is a new trend. I just ran into this myself. Okay, okay. So no need to test for them, which is redonkulous to me. It's only anaphylactic, which means you can die from it, so we're not going to test for it. It makes me crazy. Well, what they're saying is that all, it's not really an allergy if you just get inflammation. Exactly. It's only an allergy if you have an anaphylactic reaction. And, and I just went through this with my allergist. But anyway, okay. she says, we try GF, DF, CF. I don't know uh, oh, it's D. what the DF is. Yeah. Dairy-free, maybe. Oh, dairy-free. Uh, I No, because, yeah. No, I don't no, know. No, no. Just I don't know. let us Tell know. Us. No, Jan. <laughs> yeah. I, I say try because he's really fighting it now. Uh, to him, the only sign he has is loose bowel movements, but we see attention and hyperactivity. How do I get more of the testing? I'm worried there are more things we should be looking yeah. for. Yeah, order the kit. Order the food sensitivity kit. There it comes go. home. It's fantastic. You can do it at home. Yeah. And there's lots of different ones, by the way. You can select. I mean, there are ones that only measure about 100 things. There are ones that measure 300 different things. Like, they're amazing. I haven't amazing. ordered anything like this in a while. Do you remember? Do you get that from Great Labs? Or you, you? No, Amazon. Amazon. You can order okay. it online. Like, okay. they have them everywhere now. It's so easy to access these food sensitivity. Just look up food sensitivity. You'll get a million options. Okay. It's really just about... Like the cost goes up if you're looking for 300 different variants. Okay. Then it's something something around $230, $250. Yeah. If you're looking for fewer things, then it's cheaper. I mean, they're amazing tests. There you go. Maggie says, my 10-year-old son does not want to uh, try to eat foods like chips, pretzels, crackers because of the noise they make. How to train him to help him try and eat foods like these? Yeah. Wow, th I love that question because... It just, it's a reminder of how many different things we have to think about, right? And with our mm -hmm. kids, texture and no sound are important. Whereas like with us, they, they, they so, you know, like we sound, it, right? sound might bother us, but it doesn't necessarily av make us avoid eating something, right? But with our kids, it's so intense. We get over it to eat the We chips. get over it, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so um, first of all, I would say, um, <laughs> how do I say this? Uh, evaluate the value of teaching him to eat things like chips, pretzels, and crackers before you dive into this. In other words, do you really want him eating chips, cr cr crackers, and pretzels? 
because none of those products are going to be whole, whole foods, right. and none of them are going to be that good right. for him. So not sure you want to go down that path. Right. But is if you necessary? do, is it necessary? Uh, is it better just to let him not eat those things? Right. Um, and focus more on things. There are other things that might be very important for him to eat that are also noisy or crunchy. So, you know, like anything else, uh, you will, there's multiple different things you can do. First of all, you can give him, you can help him avoid it, right? That's, let's just start with that. If you choose to, you can help him avoid it. And the way you do that is you give him headphones or earbuds Whatever you decide, he can put those on or in. These are the things I talk about. Like, it really has to do with your choice of how you want your child to live. If you feel like, I, you know, I use the example of my, my husband who, when he travels, he has to have his ear um, headphones just because it reduces anxiety for him. Yeah. And it's totally fine. Right. So it, can someone who is going to go to a restaurant or eat just put in earbuds or headphones? Sure, why not? There's nothing that's okay. He can do that as long as he has access to those things in school, let's say, during lunch or whatever it is. So he can do that, and he can avoid the sound altogether. If you don't want him to avoid the sound, if you want him to learn, then you just do it as a gradual shaping procedure. So one chip and then he gets something that doesn't make noise. Two chips, and then he gets something that doesn't make noise. So you just gradually shape it, right? So that he ends up eating a handful of chips, and then he will get the thing that he likes or doesn't make noise and doesn't bother him. Um, and that's just it. But remember, we all have preferences in food. Not everybody likes everything, you know, so it, we should be okay with allowing our kids to have preferences as long as they get the nutritional values they need. Absolutely. And, and those items, chips, pretzels, crackers, etc., are not really providing a lot of nutritional value. Yeah. They're providing a lot of carbs, and yeah. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that yeah. for him. Carl wants to know, this is where we're going to rapid fire questions. Carl wants to know, what about autistic adults that are nonverbal drinking alcohol? Yeah. So again, there's, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. That's a really good question, Carl. Uh, um, I'm not sure that you, sh any, okay, so let's just talk about alcohol in, per se. Alcohol is a poison, is a toxin that we as human beings use for social purposes. We use it to reduce inhibition and to interact more socially. That is what alcohol was meant for, is used for, etc. Now, there are some people who become addicted to that mm -hmm. because without that, they are very uncomfortable in their own skin for a variety of reasons, and alcohol makes them feel not just reducing their inhibitions, but it just makes them feel normal. So then they become addicted to it, right? And they, they drink it forever. And that becomes a problem. Um, and then there are other people who just don't really find alcohol useful to them in any way, socially or non-socially, and they don't go for that, right? But first, let's remember that it is a toxin. So when you ingest alcohol, physically what it does to you is a bunch of different things that require your body to detoxify. I don't care who you are, no matter what, you will need to detoxify. In general, a lot of individuals on the spectrum have low redox. They have a, they have a problem with detoxification. So I'm not sure it's a good idea to give them something that is very heavy for them to detoxify from. Secondly, if it's a nonverbal autistic adult, I'm not sure that it's producing the positive effect of increasing social behavior. And it certainly doesn't reduce pain. So I'm not really sure what it would, how it would benefit the individual. I don't think it would. Now, in, in the past, I did a show a long, long time ago about the use of medical marijuana for individuals on the spectrum. And that I find is different because there are individuals who are in severe pain and they find that the use of medical marijuana helps them. That I have no problem with because if there's a, a, something that is not harmful that is going to reduce pain, it seems like a, an appropriate thing. Yeah. But I don't really see that for 
alcohol usage. And I guess my question is, are they requesting it? Like, yeah, I, I mean, that's I, I mean, another. I just, just want to know yeah. if that's the thing. Hey, we're saying hi to Judy. Good afternoon. And Stephen wants to know, hi, my son doesn't have repetitive restrictive behaviors, but is diagnosed with autism. Autism Is that possible? Mm -hmm. He was diagnosed by a pediatrician, developmental pediatrician, and pediatric neurologist. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to have what's considered repetitive behavior, but you do have to meet the criteria for that particular section. So these could be other symptoms, and the symptoms could be things such as sensory sensitivity could exist. Uh, routines, those are classified as like insistence on routines. Those are things that are restricted, repetitive in some right. ways. So things that people consider to be obsessive compulsive in a way. Um, and uh, in, like it, extreme interest in one area or another. So for instance, someone who wants to take everything apart and put it back together, or someone who wants to memorize all uh, geographical facts about something. Those are all classified under, under this heading. So they could, they don't have to be things like, you know, hand, uh, finger flicking or things that are more overtly observable behavior. They can be other types of behaviors that are also considered restrictive, repetitive. Um, <clears throat> if you look up diagnostic criteria for autism and you look at all the options for that domain, which is the stereotypical, repetitive stereotypical behaviors domain. And if you find that your child does not have those, then you might want to go back in and get, an, uh, get someone else to give you a second opinion on the yeah. diagnosis because uh, certainly some of those are required. There we go. Uh, probably our last question, Nada says, my five and a half year old autistic son scored a 67 <laughs> on his IQ test. This is an average of two tests, one scored really high and the other one was low. The test is done so that, uh, so that he can go to school. How reliable is an IQ test for him and what does this IQ t test mean in terms of his learning <clears throat> capabilities and future? Yes, very good question. Yeah. So. Um, IQ stands for intelli intelligence quotient, and the, the quotient or the decimal is your child's mental age divided by their chronological age. So for instance, for me, my, <coughs> and then times 100. So it's the mental age divided by the chronological age times 100. So a lot of people, their, whatever their mental age is, let's say my mental age would be 60, and my chronological age, my actual age, is 60. So it's 60 divided by 60, which is 1, times 100. So my IQ becomes 100. 100 is normal IQ. And um, it's, it, as, like everything else, we are a population of people. So we're not all, all going to have an IQ of 100. Some are going to be 95. Some are going to be 105, et cetera. And there's what we call a normal curve. That means that... Uh, uh, the vast majority of people, I think it's something like 97% of people will fall within one standard deviation below or above the 100. That means that the vast majority of people, like 97% of the of people, will be, and the, the standard deviation for IQ is 15 points. So the vast majority of people will be between 85 and 115, okay? So that's classified as, as normal IQ. Now, uh, what does it mean for our children? How do we measure mental age? That's very, very important. We measure mental age through a series of activities that are done in IQ tests. And there's lots of different IQ tests, but they all have different activities that they ask you to do. And then if you do them successfully, you pass or you get a specific score. And if you don't do them correctly, you don't pass and you don't get a... The two, I think, that you're re referring to are verbal and performance. Those are the two types of measures that take place in, let's say, the Wexler test or some of the IQ tests. And it's, so they go together, and then they're giving, giving you an overall IQ. And it's important to know which one is which, right? Because the majority of the time, our children will perform poorly on verbal scales of IQ because 
I'm telling you something in, in a language that you may not understand. So for example, a very young, like an early, early IQ test or mental age test, the Bailey asks the child to do things like, you know, there's like a farm and they'll say, put the pig next to the cow, just as an example. Yeah. If the child doesn't know what pig and cow are or next to is, they're gonna fail at that, right? right? That doesn't necessarily mean that their intelligence or their abilities, their brain abilities are not all there. Yeah. It just means that they never learn those labels. And, and this becomes very, very apparent when you take very intelligent, nonverbal uh, children who are deaf, right? Children yes. who are uh, hearing impaired. And, and you give them, or let's say as an example, there used to be years ago, uh, a lot of research that was done on sociocultural effects of IQ, where like you would take um, an a IQ test and give it to someone from a very, very low socioeconomic background, let's say, yeah. and they just would fail because they didn't know those specific advanced vocabulary words that yeah. were being used. And so IQ tests became a very touchy subject because, I, if, think about it, if you are a child who doesn't has language difficulty, right, and I give you an IQ test, you're always gonna score lower because of the language aspect, not yeah. because of the intelligence aspect, but because of the language. Yeah. The only way that it, this becomes a little bit more valid, little bit, not 100% more valid, is if I use a nonverbal test, a test that I would use, let's say, for hearing impaired children. It becomes a little bit better, but again, a child with autism is having all kinds of sensory issues as well. They're distracted, the lights might be bothering them, they might have GI issues, whatever it is. They're, our kids are not always on their best place, right? They're not always performing at their best. And they're very, um, you know, anxious in new environments with a doctor, perhaps. And there's lots of factors that can interfere with the child's responsiveness on an IQ test. Um, so, therefore, in general, IQ tests are not the most valid with our kids. And they can change. And they can change. And they do change, they do. obviously. And they that's do. like one of our goals with intensive ABA is we always give an IQ test in the beginning and we try to give the children who are nonverbal, nonverbal IQ tests. There are a few, I've talked about this in the past, the lighter R, the Merrill Palmer, there might be new ones now too. But these tests will measure your child's intelligence as best as possible. And then a year later after doing intensive therapies, you wanna measure it again and again. And you wanna to get to a point where your child's IQ score is increasing and it correlates a lot with their increase in language, increase in comprehension, increase in ability to pay attention. All, as they're learning all of these things, their IQ score will also increase. So I guess it's, it's important to think about that when you're talking about IQ because we tend to think of our kids as intellectually disabled, whereas a lot of our kids are not intellectually disabled, they just don't have we don't, we don't have access to measuring their pure intelligence That's through right. IQ tests. That's right. So don't put much store in it, Nada. Think of it as a baseline and it's only, you know, as, as you work, uh, like you've got lots of room to go yeah. up and you absolutely can. Yeah. This was, I mean, you wrote this and I was like, oh, this was our story. We, at, w the first time they tested him, they couldn't get a score at all. Yeah. Said he doesn't have enough language to get a score. Yep. The next time we got one high score, one low score. Yep. And they said it's invalid because they're so far apart. That's right. Right? That's right. So, uh, and now he's got a, he has a much higher than average IQ. So don't worry, but don't lose sleep over it. Don't sweat it. Yeah. Just make sure that you're getting good therapies and he's learning lots of good things. And, and Nara, I want to go back to exactly what Shannon is saying. If one scored really high and one scored really low, and if I'm assuming correctly that you're referring to the performance and verbal uh, portions of the IQ test, to begin with, if the score difference is over 15 points, I think, then it's not really a valid uh, test. But for your knowledge, what, you always want to gain something out of these tests. And what I would suggest is if your child is doing very low on verbal relatively high on performance, that means there's a lot of language to be taught. If, you, if it's the reverse and your child's having an issue with performance scale, then that means that there's a lot of inattention going on. I would really ask the person who administered the test to sit with you and go over every subtest and explain to you how it was done and what it measures because 
that is where you learn a lot. That's when you realize, oh, wow, he's having an issue with things that are visual memory. Oh, he's having an issue with anything that's an auditory instruction. Go through the details. I promise you, you learn a lot. Don't worry about the score. The score changes. Okay, we're past time, so we got to stop. And we didn't get to all the questions, and I apologize. I want to let you know that next week the topic is autism and sleep, but we can still answer questions about nutrition next week. But to yes. people who didn't get their question answered, I do apologize. Um, you, please resubmit them next week, and we'll keep them in the hopper, and I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I want to remind you that tomorrow's show, we're doing Autism Live. We have Ling Xiao is going to be with us, and she is from Spectrum AI. And and I'm really interested in hearing about what they're doing because it's all about making sure that we get to good outcomes and playing well with insurance companies. Yes. I'm very excited. She's somebody who's spent her life working in insurance and has now created this other thing to help better outcomes. So looking forward to that. Then on Thursday, we have stories from the spectrum. And on Friday, we have Let's Talk Movies with Moira and Shannon. And we are finally busy week. doing, uh, yeah, busy week. We are finally doing our Barbenheimer uh, review. I don't know if you've seen both Barbie and Ar uh, Oppenheimer. I've seen Oppenheimer, which okay. I loved. OK, well, we'll have to talk about that. I have okay. many things to say about that, but that that's on Friday. Uh, and then uh, I'm away, you know, uh, traveling, but we'll be back. We're not doing a show on Monday, a rerun, but then we're back on Tuesday live here with Dr. Grand Pichet, and the topic will be autism and sleep. So um, and then on Wednesday, we have Matt and Nava Paskowitz Asner going to be here to talk oh, about yeah. their concert, which, uh, you know, we're so oh, thrilled about. Oh, my gosh. Um, so many wonderful people, including Ringo and oh. Ubastank, um, and so many other people, wait. Colin Hay, wait. all these people, and Logan Shepard Logan playing the drums playing for Toto, Toto. I can't uh, that. which it's is insane. absolutely, you know, beyond it's belief. Insane. So they're going to talk about all that with us next Wednesday. That's yep. next Wednesday. We're out of time. Thank you all for being, for being here. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye, everyone. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.